Hi friends, welcome to our online gathering. For this session, let's reflect on the beauty of nature. I love going out for nature walks because I can see scripture come alive as I look up into the mountains or to feel the breeze of the wind. I sense how big God is and how he looks after us. I'll read from Psalms 121, also called the Song of Ascent. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleep. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. We ascend into God's presence because our help comes from Christ. We are more than conquerors, and whom shall we fear as we can boldly connect with God who loves and looks after us? Breakable with you 
about is sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins. Our Lord, our God, our conqueror.
Thanks, music team. It's so encouraging to see our youth and young adults stepping up to lead and to come alongside other generations as we get involved as a church community together. So here is our family news for today. Kids Sports Camp. I remember growing up in the church and attending kids summer camps. The leaders were so friendly. Someone I looked up to and wanted to be. And now, here I am. And we want to give kids something positive to remember with our kids sports camp coming up. So our camp starts tomorrow, Monday, July 19th, for one week until Friday, July 23rd. If you're interested, hurry up to register because we still have limited last minute availability. You can register online as you find the Kids Sports Camp page on our Jericho website. Throughout this summer, Pastor Jenna is leading a small group at our Jericho Center on Thursdays from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. Four Portraits, One Jesus is the topic the group will go through as they examine the four Gospels and how those four perspectives paint a distinctive portrait of Jesus in order to better understand who Jesus is for us today. At Jericho, we started our house and home matching grant. In this campaign, we're aiming at paying off our down payment for our building by Thanksgiving of 2021. Every donation you make towards this capital campaign until Thanksgiving will be doubled. So House and Homes, you know, it's the name of this campaign. And it's a way to say that this building is not just our house, but also our home, a place to connect and to build relationships. So we're inviting you to pray into this as we open up ourselves to God to do big things within and around us. Giving is one of the many ways to contribute collectively, and we thank you to those who have given to our church. You can give by going to our website and engaging the Give option. You can text the word Jericho to 77977, or you can drop it off at our Jericho Center secure mailbox. So now we have Pastor Brad to share with us our message for today as we continue in the book of Esther. Well, hello, friends. Uh, my name is Brad, and I'm part of the teaching and leadership team here at Jericho Ridge, and we are past the midway point of July. How did that happen already? Pastor Wally's been away uh, for a few weeks of holidays. We're having summer sports camp this week, and then poof, before you know it, summer's going to be over. Sorry to rain on your parade. But I am excited for us to continue our study this month in the biblical book of Esther in the Old Testament. And we've entitled this study, Truth to power. And Esther's the story of a young immigrant woman who moves from obscurity to the position of queen of the land and who at great personal cost to her and to her family speaks a very difficult truth to power and ends up saving her people. And today we're going to see a major advance in the plot because Esther finally makes her move and makes her request to the king. And this is a fascinating and somewhat complicated story. So let's just pause and refresh our memory about who is who and where we are at in this whole thing. So if you've been tracking with us, this story is set in the ancient Middle Eastern Empire of Persia in the 5th century BCE. And uh, Haman, who is the main villain in the story, when we last met him, he had just hatched a plan to eliminate all of the members of the ancient Jewish people scattered throughout the Persian Empire. And he tricked the king, King Xerxes, into signing into law an unjust proclamation that every man, every woman, and every child would be killed who was Jewish or had Jewish history. And their people who murdered them could then take away their property. And then at the end of Esther chapter 3, Haman sits down with the king to have a drink while the capital city falls into confusion. Then last week, Brady built the tension in the story for us by helping us understand the counter plan that Mordecai and Esther hatched together to stand up to Haman's evil plot. And Mordecai is pushing Esther to go and see the king, try and change and challenge this bad Persian law. But there's just one problem we see in chapter 4, verse 11. Uh, Esther reminds her cousin Mordecai, who works in civic administration within the palace in some way, that, quote, all of the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited in is doomed to die unless the king holds out his golden scepter. And the king, Esther says, has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. 
So the problem with Esther and Mordecai's plan is that in the ancient world, you didn't just pop into the king's court to say hello or to ask for a favor or anything like that. No, no, no. You came when the king called you or you did not come at all. And if you appeared uninvited, you were executed. So Esther then invites Mordecai and all of the other Jews in the capital city to fast and to pray, so to abstain from eating or drinking, in this case, for three days, so she can seek God and discern what to do. So when we left, last left Haman, our main antagonist, he's in high spirits, he's drinking, he's pleased with himself. We leave our protagonist, our main character, Esther, kind of in low spirits, because she's deeply aware of the challenges in front of her and her people. But we also see in her this courageous resolve that was highlighted for us in chapter 15. She says, then, though it's against the law, I will go in to see the king, and if I must die, I must die. So this is Esther and Mordecai's plan. Pray first, act definitively. But what is Esther's big plan once she gets in front of the king? We don't know yet. But we do get this window into her courage that even in the face of all kinds of tumultuous circumstances around her, she is resolved to do what comes to her and her community as a result of a focused time seeking God in prayer. She's gonna make an attempt to save her people. And if that fails, well, at least she sought the Lord and at least she's tried. So now let's turn our attention to chapter five of Esther and we're going to read what happens. Esther 5 verse 1 says this. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. On the third day of the fast, Esther put on her royal robes and entered the inner court of the palace just across from the king's hall. And the king was sitting on his royal throne facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her. He held out the gold scepter to her. So Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. And the king asked her, what do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? I will give it to you, even if it is half the kingdom. And Esther replied, if it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a banquet that I have prepared for the king. So the king turned quickly to his attendants and said, tell Haman to come quickly to a banquet as Esther has requested. So the king and Haman went to Esther's banquet. It's an interesting plan, don't you think? The fate of all of your people hangs in the balance and you choose to act courageously by hosting a banquet? Really? Why not just take the king up on that whole half the kingdom offer? Well, first of all, we have to understand that that offer is a kind of uh, hyperbole, uh, hyperbole, it's a hyperbolic saying. Herod says the same thing in the gospel accounts. King Xerxes would not have meant that and certainly would not have acted on it. It's a kind of ancient overstatement. It's just being polite. But the king knows from this throne room encounter that Esther does actually have a request to make of him because she took a great risk to make that appearance. And so what is it? For whatever reason, Esther doesn't tip her hand at that moment and just come out and ask it. We're not told why. What we do know is that this particular king makes less than stellar decisions when he's drinking. We saw that in chapter one, and then we see it again in chapter three, verse 15. So maybe this is some kind of character flaw that Esther's exploiting, we're not really told. But the king and Haman agree to come to the banquet as requested. And we see Esther here is actually a very good strategist. The king's eating and drinking wine, and then let's continue reading in verse six of chapter five. While they were there drinking wine, the king said to Esther, now tell me what you really want. What is your request? I will give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. And Esther replied, this is my request and deepest wish. If I have found favor with the king and if it pleases the king to grant my request and do what I ask, please come with Haman tomorrow to the banquet that I will prepare for you and then I will explain what this is all about. 
Another banquet? I mean, Esther, how is this helpful? The king knows there's an ask coming. Why not just come out with it? Well, we, we don't know. But what we do know is that Haman takes away something quite different from this banquet. In verse 9, he is a happy man. He is excited because he feels the privilege and the exalted nature of his position is finally being recognized. He and the king are the only two exclusive guests at the queen's wine banquet. He feels that he has finally arrived. But the narrative tension in the text gets dialed up as the focus shifts back onto the conflict between Haman and Mordecai. Look with me at chapter five, verse nine, as Haman is leaving the banquet as a happy man. But when he saw Mordecai sitting at the palace gate, not standing up or trembling nervously before him, Haman became furious. However, he restrained himself and went on home. Then Haman gathered together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, and boasted to them about his great wealth and his many children. He bragged about the honors the king had given to him and how he'd been promoted over all the other nobles and officials. And then Haman added, that's not all. Queen Esther invited only me and the king himself to a banquet she prepared for us. And she's invited me to dine with her and the king again tomorrow. Then he added, but this is all worth nothing as long as I see Mordecai the Jew just sitting there at the palace gate. So let's pause for a moment and consider just how fragile your ego has to be if you're at the height of your success and your power and you cannot enjoy it if one guy defies you. We see here that Haman is a petty, petty, small, man who has been promoted well above the place that his character can sustain. He's easily provoked. He has huge emotional swings. He's vindictive. He pouts very, very easily and quickly, just to name a few of his flaws. And while it can be easy to pick on Haman, let's be honest for a moment. Many of us have fragile egos. We walk into a room and we immediately begin sizing up every other person in there. We wanna know where we stand socially, economically, or in some other metric to those in that room. We orient ourselves too easily by our status, how many followers or friends we have on social media, what kind of pictures other people are posting versus what we're doing with our lives, what kind of cool jobs or hobbies we have or don't have, what kind of degree we have, the prestige of the institution that it came from, what kind of car we drive or phone model we have or any number of other reference points. But when we do this, there's a fragility to that. We're actually placing our worth and our emotional state into the hands of something that can change or will be taken from us, something that's temporary. And when our fortunes change or when one person makes a slightly negative comment, we get thrown off of our game. And intriguingly, we meet in this chapter Haman's wife, Zeresh, and she calls a bit of a meeting of Haman's supportive friends who commiserate with him about how horrible, awful, terrible day he's gonna to continue to have if this Mordecai guy isn't dealt with. Remember, Mordecai is going to be dealt with in their minds in the elimination of the Jewish people in less than 11 months, but Haman is so fragile and in such a hurry that he cannot endure that kind of humiliation for that long. He must have what he deems as ego justice. And so his friends and his wife suggest the following in chapter five, verse 14. Why don't you set up a sharpened pole that stands 75 feet tall and in the morning ask the king to impale Mordecai on it. When this is done, you can go on your merry way to the banquet with the king. And this pleased Haman and so he ordered the pole set up. We're gonna revisit this pole at the end of today but it's worth noting that we're breaking up the flow of the story to jump into the second banquet. Pastor Wally's actually gonna be dealing with chapter six. Uh, which is a bit of a subplot that happens in between Banquet 1 and Banquet 2 next week. So just hold space for the altering of the flow of time between this week and next week, please. 
But we're going to jump to Banquet 2, which begins in Chapter 7, because this is now Esther's third opportunity for an ask. So let's pick up the narrative in Chapter 7, verse 1. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. On this second occasion, while they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, tell me what you want, Queen Esther. What is your request? I will give it to you, even if it is half the kingdom. And Queen Esther replied, if I have found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had merely been sold as slaves, I could remain quiet, for that would be too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king. So this time, Esther goes for it. Like right away. The king probably is expecting what most people ask for, prestige or honor, and can you get my friend a cushy job in the palace somewhere? But no, Esther jumps right in. She says, my request, you want to know what it is? It's to spare my life and the lives of my people. If forced slavery was all that was going to happen, I would not have bothered you, but this is kind of a big deal for me. And the language that Esther uses, she notes that both her and her people have been sold likely a reference to the money that Haman had promised to put into the treasury and that they are to be, quote, destroyed and killed and annihilated. And this is the same wording that was used in the king's own public decree, which Haman wrote. And this appears then to be public information. And the king gathers from her intel that there is a person behind this plot. So he asks her directly, in Esther chapter seven, verse five. Who would do such a thing, King Xerxes demanded? Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you, the queen? Esther replied, this wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. And Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Then the king jumped to his feet in a rage and went out into the palace garden. So the king, who had not been bothered to get the details of the edict that was sent out under his name, is so distressed that he leaves to the garden. We don't know why or what he was up to. Did he need time to think? Did he need time to confer with palace officials to determine Haman's fate? For some reason, he leaves Haman and Esther alone, which sets up the final and dramatic turning point in this confrontation. Let's keep reading in Esther chapter 7, verse 7. Haman, however, stayed behind to plead for his life with Queen Esther, for he knew that the king intended to kill him. And in despair, he fell on the couch where Queen Esther was reclining, just as the king was returning from the palace garden. And the king exclaimed, Will he even assault the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes? Dramatic reversal. One commentator notes that the man who was angry because Mordecai would not prostrate himself before him, now finds himself prostrate before Mordecai's cousin. But Haman has, in this moment, also broken palace protocols, something Esther herself was loath to do. He's near to or he's touching the queen while alone with her, which is against the law in Persia. And so the king naturally flips out and construes this as an assault. And this is the end of the line for Haman. As soon as the king spoke, verse 8, his attendants covered Haman's face, signaling his doom. And then Harbana, one of the king's eunuchs, said, hmm, Haman has set up a sharpened pole that stands 75 feet tall in his own courtyard. He intended to use it to impale Mordecai, the man who saved the king from assassination. More on that next week. And... Then the king said, impale Haman on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole that he had set up for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. It's a pretty dramatic series of events for a banquet. But we have to pause and ask, 
Okay, so that happened. What might we learn from this part of the story that we could apply in our lives today? I mean, the circumstances of our lives are far, far different. But I want to highlight just a few things, it's maybe four of them, that I see as important for us to understand as we wrestle with these two chapters. The first thing that we've already mentioned in the book of Esther and that I want to highlight for us again is that great courage is possible. Esther makes a bold move here. Brady mentioned it last week in his message and it bears repeating that before she makes the move, she adopts a pray first posture. Her, her courage doesn't come from nowhere. I love the poem uh, from 1921 by American author Carly Wilson Baker. And she said this, quote, courage is armor a blind man wears, that calloused scar of outlived despairs. Courage is fear that has said its prayers. See, courage comes from somewhere or more particularly from someone, that being God. Many of you are facing challenging situations which require all kinds of wisdom, complex family interactions and relationships, financial or business challenges as government subsidies come to an end, difficult conversations that you know you need to have. And there are many things which can cause us to shrink away or stay silent, but Esther models for us a kind of posture and pattern of courage that is helpful. She's faced with a challenging situation, pray first, but then also act. Great courage is possible, not because you have all things figured out, but because you have lived into that place of knowing that God is present with you, giving you the courage to act even in the face of challenges. The second thing that we see here in this section of the book of Esther is that not only are great courage possible, but great reversals are also possible. Esther goes from being an immigrant outsider to being queen. She's come very quickly from the bottom of the heap to the top, and then Haman goes from the top of the heap to the bottom of the heap. In a very short period of time, Esther is appraised of the plot, she's praying and she's acting, and then the originator of the evil design is removed from the scene. Haman, who seems in every way at the very top of his career and power and untouchable, is instantly disposed. And then there's a very public reversal where Haman's body is publicly disgraced and displayed on that super high impaling pole, while Mordecai, who was the intended target of Haman's hatred, is spared. And what this can show us is that things don't always stay as they are right now. You might be looking at a situation that feels like it will never change. And God's invitation to you might be to open your heart and your mind and your spirit up again to the possibility that with God, things can change quickly and sometimes in an instant. You might be thinking about a family member for whom you've been praying for years who's estranged from you or from God. And you've come to the settled conclusion that nothing will ever change about that person and situation. But friend, this reminds us, and I wanna remind you that a great reversal can happen sometimes in an instant. Those who are sick can be Heal. Those who are in power and actively opposing things which are good can suddenly not be in power. God can and does still work miracles where things shift dramatically. And at the same time, we need to acknowledge that when dealing with complex problems, things may not change overnight. And this is the third thing that we actually see in this part of the narrative, that tension, ongoing tension, is to be expected. See, Esther has done away with Haman, but we're going to see in the coming weeks the problem still looms. The people of God are still, by law, scheduled for annihilation. One part of the problem, the Haman part of it, has disappeared, but not all of it. 
Esther's still living with, and her people are facing a big, big challenge. And sometimes evangelical Christians are quick to jump to platitudes and what I call magic Jesus. And what I mean by this is we can fall into thinking that when you have a problem, you're just simply going to pray and poof, magic Jesus will solve it for you. No close parking spots at the mall today? Just pray and presto, magic Jesus will get one for you. Problem solved. And you and I know, friend, if we're honest, that life is just not often that simple. See here, Esther acts with great courage, with wisdom, with faith after praying, and one aspect of the problem gets solved, but the larger issue is still an issue. And many times in our lives, and maybe you today feel like you're living through a challenge that feels like it partially solved, but it's not yet over. Those of you who are nurses, work in healthcare, you're still living through the effects of a very challenging season. Those of you who are teachers, many of you who are still reeling from the strain of teaching both online and in person and in ways that you did not expect or need to. Many of you who are parents are still feeling the rhythms and disruption. We're all still living with the after effects as a country, as a community, as individuals of a massive event. And so some ongoing tension, some residual stress, is actually normal and to be expected. COVID might be looking like it's in our rearview mirror, perhaps, but that doesn't mean that all of our challenges have poof up and disappeared. That kind of thinking, which can tend to take root in Christian circles, can be very unproductive and unhelpful because most challenges we live with are complex, chronic kinds of challenges that are not solved quickly or easily. And so let me ask you a harder question. How are you at waiting? What does it look like to persist and stay in it for the long term when only part of the solution has come? Most worship songs are not great at this, and frankly, most Christians are not great at it either. So, friends, let's buck that trend. Let's learn to be those who live well in the in-between spaces, in the tension, and with respect for mystery. And the mystery part of t this text, to me, is what makes this narrative so compelling. Why did Esther wait till she did to make her ask? I don't know, it's mysterious. But we do know, fourthly and finally, that timing is critical. Esther had a sense of when to make the right move that she knew that she needed to make. She had sought God in prayer, but there was still a pathway of patience and continuing to discern and ask the question, is this a good time to say what I need to say? Wisdom in timing is also something that we can learn here, and we're gonna press into that more in the coming weeks. And so as we wrap up our teaching time today, let me pray for you. And I wanna pray for you that God would continue to give you great courage as needed. That God would give you great faith to see some great reversals in your life and in circumstances around you. And that God would also give you the patience when those don't always happen on the timeline that you and I expect. And that God would give you wisdom to know when and how to speak and what to say when it's time to open your mouth. Let's pray together. Jesus, you are good and kind to us. You give us wisdom when we ask it, Holy Spirit. And so we come to you today in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, and we are asking for wisdom. And you remind us in the book of James, God, that you give that generously. You pour it out liberally to those who need it and who ask you with faith. And so I pray for each person today that's watching, that as they seek you and ask you for that wisdom, to know what and when and how to act in these moments of great tension and challenge, that you would give that to them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Friends, we're gonna to respond to God in worship and these songs describe for us that kind of posture that I wanna invite us to live into of seeing that those many things of challenge and complexity around us, we can still learn and be people who trust in God.
the sea to still, the rage in me to still.
Well, our benediction today is a prayer for others during this season. Let me pray it for you. Loving and healing God, we turn to you in prayer. We are confident that you are with us and with all people in every moment. And so we stand before you as people of hope, trusting in your care and protection. May your faithful love support us and soothe the anxiety of our hearts. Generous God, would you fill us with compassion and concern for others, young and old, that we may look after one another in these challenging days. Bring healing to those in our world who are sick with the virus. Be with their families. May those who have died rest in your eternal embrace, comfort their family and friends. Would you strengthen and protect all medical professionals caring for the sick and all those who work in our medical facilities? Give wisdom, God, to leaders in healthcare and governance that they might make the right decisions for the well-being of people. And we pray in gratitude for all those in our country who will continue to work in the days ahead in so many fields of life for the sake and the flourishing of us all. Bless them and keep them safe. O oh God of creation and life, we place ourselves in your protection and may the mantle of your peace unfold us on this day and tomorrow. Amen. Well, I wanna invite you to join us next weekend as Pastor Wally opens for us again the story of Esther in chapter six. And I look forward to seeing you then. Take care, friends. You overcome this world with love and make my fight your own. I lift my eyes and throw fear aside and sing out into the even when the world caves, even when the fight calls, even when the war is waged, I'll take heart. I know you are greater, forever you are Savior. I will sing your praise with all that I have, with all that I
heart won't let the darkness beat me down. Sing in the night, my hope alive in you. I'll walk through the fire and not be burned. Pray in the fight and watch you turn. Jesus, tonight I give it all to you.